Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. I'm going to try another product repair today. This is a Roden Schwartz SFV 40-N Spectrum and Signal Analyzer, 9 kHz to 40 GHz. This is the highest frequency spectrum analyzer from Roden Schwartz that I've actually had in the lab here, so it's going to be exciting to take a look and see how it works and what's wrong with it. This was again provided by Altest, who have a huge inventory of used and refurbished equipment, as well as a set of new services that they provide. I have talked about them all before, of course, and there's a link in the description jumping to different kind of services and products they have. If you're looking for used instruments, they have an enormous inventory. That's why they can send so many different ones here for us to play around with. So this unit, something's wrong with it. First, we want to figure out what that is and see if we can fix it. And here it is powered on, and it of course has the GUI with the multiple tab support, something that I think Rodin Shores pioneered and essentially everybody else copied after that. Now I played around a little bit with it without it being connected to anything, and it passes self-test and it passes all the self-alignments. So I ran all those functions and it seems fine. So that's a little bit interesting. It's both good and bad for us who are trying to repair it because it doesn't detect any problems on its own. So let's actually hook it up to the source and see if it really is broken and see what's wrong with it. So I'm going to go ahead and use the Lucid Series Tabor Electronics Synthesizer here, which is USB control this. I've done a full teardown and review of the Lucid Series instruments from Tabor, of course. And we're going to use this up to 12 gigahertz and see what the spectrum analyzer actually displays. So I've restricted the spectrum analyzer only up to 15 gigahertz because that's the maximum anyway that roughly we can see. So right now we're set to 100 megahertz. I'm going to turn it on. And uh, where is it? Oh my god, the tone is tiny. It's all the way in the corner here, so it's essentially nothing. The power should be 0 dBm. So let's increase the frequency. So let's see, here's, let's go to a gigahertz. And let's see what happens. There's the gigahertz. Oh yeah, okay, so it's quite a bit larger. Let's do a peak search on this. Okay, so it's sitting at minus 34 dBm. So it's about 34 dB down where it should be. We can continue increasing the frequency. Here's 2 gigahertz. Oh, look at that. It is actually getting larger and larger. But this looks quite familiar. I think we've seen this kind of problem many times before, actually. This is 10 gigahertz. And let's go all the way to 12 gigahertz, which is the maximum we can do with this instrument. And here's 12 gigahertz. And what do we have at 12 gigahertz? So 12 gigahertz, we're at minus 10. So we're still 10 dB down, but it's very suspicious. So this looks like some kind of a capacitively coupled problem. Now, since the instrument passes all of its self-tests and everything, we have to take a look at the architecture and see where those signals are actually injected into the signal path of the spectrum analyzer so that we can see where the failure could be. I worry that the failure might just be the connector again, but hopefully not. Well, maybe something a bit more complicated, but we have to investigate a little bit further. So here's the block diagram of the spectrum analyzer from the service manual. So here is the 20 hertz to F max represented here essentially to the maximum frequency that the spectrum can analyzer can go. And if you look, there's a above 7 gigahertz and a below 7 gigahertz section. So it's obvious that this instrument treats those two frequencies differently and in fact has a totally separate block here, which is a separate microwave board that the instrument is equipped with if it's above 7 gigahertz model. And of course this one is because this one goes to 40 gigahertz, so we have this one. And the way it appears to work is the signal, whatever it is, this maximum frequency enters this diplexer. And this diplexer will then break that signal into two and then feed whatever is above 7 gigahertz into the YIG filter. And whatever is below 7 gigahertz essentially just comes back and that goes into the front end. So signals less than 7 gigahertz go into a front end into an IF of 89.9 megahertz. And anything above 7 GHz goes to the YIC microwave converter into an IF of 729.9 MHz, which is then going into the front end, converted yet again to 89.9. .9. So depending on the frequencies, you can have double or triple conversion on the signal. And this is very common, again, with spectrum analyzers. We've talked about these quite a bit in the past. Everything else is just mostly the rest of the peripherals that the instrument needs. But we need to focus on this portion here, and I'll show you why, because a lot of this is probably self-tested by the stuff that is built in. We should look for the calibration signal and see where that is injected. Let's go down here. Okay, so here's the block diagram of the front end. There you go, everything up to 7 gigahertz, and look at that. Here's the calibration. You can see the calibration is fed into the path so that it checks the rest of the system, but it looks like that the diplexer and the front end preamplifier, if you have it, and all these switches are not tested uh, using the calibration signal. So I wonder if there is a portion in the front that you simply cannot test uh, when the instrument does its own self-testing. Uh, so let's see what it looks like 
for the higher frequency. There we go. Here's the block diagram for instruments that go up to 40 gigahertz or 30 gigahertz. Here's our diplexer. There you go. This thing splits the signal and all the sub 7 gigahertz signals go out, which goes back into the other block we were just talking about. Here's our YAC filter. Here's the converter and the IF coming out. Uh, where is it here? Go. IF coming out at 730 or so, and LO being injected into this. So obviously, we are not actually testing this uh, so much. We injected signals above, se above, above and below 7 gigahertz, and there didn't seem to be a sharp transition between the two of them. So something else is wrong. So I suspect that it may be something in the front end portion, actually the front end attenuator potentially, and we have to take a look. Okay, let's do some more testing and figure it out. So in this really simple setup, I'm measuring the return loss of the input of the spectrum analyzer using this network analyzer. And I don't know if you can see or not on the screen, but it's at zero. So basically there is and essentially an ideal open or ideal short at the input of the spectrum analyzer, which is very strange. Let's take a closer look. So here's a close look at the return loss, as you can see, is essentially just zero across the entire frequency range. Now I can change the input attenuation setting of the spectrum analyzer. So if there's something wrong after the attenuator, we should be able to see the return loss get better as the attenuator goes into higher attenuation states. So right now the attenuator is set to zero. I can increase it. Here's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, absolutely no difference. So it is, it is as if the input of the spectrum analyzer doesn't even see the attenuator. I can obviously hear the attenuator click, but nothing changes. Let me show you what I was expecting to see. So here's an example using an external mechanical attenuator that's adjustable manually and the termination at the other end. So the port one of the network analyzer is connected to one end of the attenuator and the other end of the attenuator is terminated. And right now this is set to zero. So basically it's like a through piece. So we are essentially seeing a 50 ohm termination and that's not surprising. You can see we have very good return loss across the frequency up to 20 gigahertz. Now if I go ahead and remove the 50 ohm termination, let's say something's broken and it's not really 50 ohm anymore. If I completely remove it, you can see that the return loss obviously gets quite a bit worse and it's essentially at zero at very low frequencies because we have an ideal open, almost an ideal open. So I'm gonna dial in a 10 dB attenuator. Look what happens. You see, as soon as I dial in a 10 dB attenuation, you can see that the return loss hits minus 20. There's many ways to think about this. Obviously, there is a forward loss and a return loss, so you get twice the loss when the signal reflects back at the open, so you get, you know, a minus 20 dB attenuation. Or another way to think about it is, as you dial in more and more attenuation, you see more and more 50 ohm looking into this port, because this is done by maintaining a 50 ohm impedance as different resistive dividers are put in. If I go into higher attenuation, for example, 40, you can see eventually we hit the noise, noise floor of the network analyzer or the non-idealities of this entire setup. So that's kind of what I was expecting. I was expecting to see some change in the return loss as we change the input attenuation of the spectrum analyzer. So that didn't happen. Well, it's time to take it apart. So here's a look inside the instrument. This is from the bottom of the unit and the front panel connector is right there. You can see a cable here looped in which connects the front panel to the electromechanical attenuator. That loop is there so that that cable can actually be installed. Otherwise there's no flex to it and you can't put it in. And you can see some ferrite beads in various places around the outer loop of the ground of the coax. Now here's the electromechanical attenuator. At the output of that goes into the diplexer. That's why I was hoping to see some change in the return loss when you look into the front panel connector by changing the mechanical attenuator. But it's invisible to it. It doesn't show up at all. So I wonder if it's really another front panel connector problem. But nonetheless, we're going to take it one step at a time. I think we can break this down in a fairly straightforward way. We connect the network analyzer once again to this input and we can disconnect the cable and look at the output here and see what is the S21 of this piece alone and then we can see if that's the problem. Okay, so here's our simple setup. We have port 1 to the front from the back of the itinerary back here and check it out. Yep, there is definitely something wrong in the front end as suspected. You can see that we are down 24 dB and the attenuation is right now set to zero. So there should basically be zero dB and you can see the sharp drop at the low frequency, very classic of some kind of disconnection that's now capacitively coupled. We can increase the attenuation by 10 dB. You can see that it jumps by exactly 10 dB. Here's another 10 dB and so on. So the attenuator seems to be working so now really that doesn't leave us with much other things to be wrong. I could just be the connector once more or maybe just the very, very front end of the attenuator could be bad. So I think the next step is just to change the setup. 
So here's the attenuator measured by itself and it is fine. Yeah, it looks good. You can see it doesn't drop at the low frequencies. So I can't believe it. It's the front end connector again. Uh, this is ridiculous. Well, anyway, we got to do it. Well, here's the attenuator measured by itself. This is a 40 gigahertz step attenuator that's made by Roden Shorts actually. And it's fine. It doesn't have that big drop at the beginning. So yeah, the problem is not with the attenuator. You can see it works perfectly fine. So yeah, it's the front panel connector again. That's kind of unfortunate, but anyway, let's take it apart. So I took the connector off the front panel and look at the shape of the plate that's holding it to the front panel. It's clearly bent, which means this thing has received a big hit from the front of the instrument, maybe dropped on its face of the instrument or something like that. But yeah, look at that. It's totally bent out of shape. So this is the problem. It doesn't look that bad, but we're gonna have to take a closer look at it. By the way, here's the air dielectric which is required of course at these frequencies you can see you can see right through the connector because it's surrounded by a very thin membrane that's holding it suspended to create a coax filled with air pretty cool so let's quickly verify that this is indeed a dc open so what i have here is the front panel connector then connected to that little cable we have a conversion from k to BNC and from BNC to banana and on the other side I have a 50 ohm termination. So what you expect to see between these two ports is 50 ohm resistance because that's what is terminating the other end if there is a DC connection which there should be. So let's give it a try. So here's our multimeter. Let's plug it in here. What do we see? And we see nothing. So it's an open circuit. This is of course we know this because we measured the S parameter and we saw that the, the through path was going down to minus infinity at very low frequencies which is essentially capacitively coupled. So these connectors are really close to each other. The center pins are very close so they're capacitively coupled but of course there is no DC connection. So we got to look further. And just in case you were wondering if you have it directly connected plug it in and of course you should see a perfect 50 ohm. There it is 49.1. So here are the two pieces of the connectors that have to mate. This is a, a standard external connector, of course. This is, Roland Schroes really likes these ones. I'm not a big fan of them. Uh, but this is the one that's on the front panel. And if you look, in order for them to essentially maintain a coaxial mode, when you insert this one into here, this outer ground goes into that and maintains a very nice connection overall. So I think this is a very high performance connector. But again, I think what has happened is that the center piece, you can see, that due to some impact it has opened up and is no longer hugging the center conductor of this coax. That could be the problem. Now, you would normally replace this piece that I'm holding completely because uh, you know you can't really bend these back, but I'm gonna do it just to see if we can make that connection happen again. Because the way it is, I mean, I don't see anything else wrong. There's nothing really to take apart. This is one piece that's been inserted into this uh, via some pr compression fitting of some sort probably. But when you want to put them together, you can see in the center that essentially goes into the center piece and when you close it, that's it. Then you have this full connection. Now when I do this, there is no connection from this center conductor to this center conductor. They're open. So that's of course that's where the failure is. So let me see if I can do that and maybe it will come back to life. So I spent a lot of time under the microscope making minor adjustments to this. And uh, yeah, the, there's a plastic membrane as I mentioned is a disc in there that actually holds this pin in the middle and it looks like because of the impact that's been pushed in so this center pin basically no longer is was out enough to make contact with the other piece so I pushed it in a little bit with quite a bit of care but you know it's not going to be perfect and this piece really does need to be replaced but I think it might be okay at least for us to get the unit up and running again all right let's repeat the same test again assemble back together and there we go. I think it's okay. It should be 50 ohms. All right, that's a step forward. Let's put it all back together. And here we're back to the test we had earlier, back through the attenuator one more time, measuring the S parameters, and now it looks considerably better. I can change the attenuation again, and you can see it jumping. There you go. All right, so it looks pretty good now. So I think that connector is at least for the time being repaired, and we just close it back up. Okay, everything back together, and I have put a trace on max hold so we can see it across frequency at 100 megahertz. It's going to enable the tone again. <laughs> there it is, all the way on the left side. You can see the amplitude looks good. I can do a peak search on it, and you can see that it is indeed 0.72 dBm. It's actually a little bit higher, but the output power of these modules can ha be a plus or minus 1 dB, so it's, I, I think it's quite accurate. So let's see. We can go up the frequency. Here is up to 1 gigahertz. We can jump every gigahertz or so. Actually, we can do even a couple hundred more megahertz here to make sure. You can see it's nice and flat. 
the power is 0 dBm, and the scale at the left side there is also 0 dBm, so it all works out. Here you go, it's 3 gigahertz, then we can go 1 gigahertz at a time, and we go all the way up to 12. And here is 11 and 12. Yeah, looks good. We can put some arbitrary frequency in the middle if you really want to, but I have no issue, no doubt that it's going to work just fine. You can see it's very nice and flat. Yeah, so you could call this fixed, but you know, it's a very, very simple issue. So I was actually contemplating not even posting this video because it was such a straightforward problem, but I'm going to do it anyway. So it's a good opportunity for you guys to let me know if you enjoyed this, even though it was so basic. Let me know if it was a good idea to post it or not. And I still have a bunch of other stuff to repair, so I'm sure we're going to get something interesting soon.